Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 44th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Got another great one for you today. We're talking politics, we're talking philosophy, we're talking academia, the left, and a bunch of other good topics with an interesting New Zealander. My guest this week is Dr. Jamie White, who started his professional career as a philosopher, but then he got involved in politics. He's the former leader of the ACT party in New Zealand, which is a classical liberal political party. He's also written some books for lay audiences and has a very interesting perspective of the current state of higher academia, especially in the soft sciences. Now, particularly relevant for this show, as it is with every show, is the sponsor of this episode. Praxis is a company that is operating outside of academia. It's operating outside of politics, outside of the nonprofit world, and it's smack in the real world. And they are in the business of giving jobs and training to competent, young, and enthusiastic people. The Praxis program is a three-month boot camp where you learn practical job skills that is followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. And after you complete their program, they contractually guarantee you a job offer. Now, that's not something that you get in the academic system. There's a really good reason for that. If you're interested in the Praxis program, go to steve-patterson.com slash Praxis, and that will take you to a special page that was created specifically for listeners of this show. You can get a free module of the Praxis curriculum sent straight to your inbox. So go check it out, steve-patterson.com slash Praxis. Fortunately, I think more and more people are waking up to just how far left and how far kind of into the world of La La Land a lot of professional academia has gone. The people that are graduating have been given a name, right? They're Generation Snowflake, because a lot of these people graduate with no ability for critical reasoning, and they are obsessively focused on protecting their feelings and protecting the feelings of what they think are minority groups. They pretty explicitly reject the idea of any kind of objective truth, and therefore discussions about philosophy or the truth or about how the world works are really discussions about power and power structures. So you're going to love this conversation with Dr. Jamie White. So let's start talking a little bit about politics. First of all, I know right now you consider yourself more of a classical liberal. Was that always the case, and how did you get to those conclusions? It's um, the result of the history of New Zealand. Hmm. Most of your listeners probably won't know this. New Zealand is now one of the most uh, economically free countries in the world. In fact, we often get the top of these various indices for that kind of thing. In 1984, we, there was a change of government. And the government leading the government, well, not just the government before that, but several governments before that. So basically since the Second World War, right through to 1984, New Zealand had been known as the Soviet Union of the South Pacific. Oh. Uh, it was unbelievable, you, the, the government control of the economy. You, just to give you a few examples to let you know Wait, how crazy yeah. it was, um, it was illegal to transport anything more than 50 miles in a truck. <laughs> and the reason for that was to protect the government's railways business. Um, oh so gosh. freight had to be, you had to put your freight by law, you had to put your freight on a train and then you could take it from where the train stopped to its ultimate destination on a truck. But Now was that a formal law or did people yes, actually that was a, live no, that in was a law. With it? And people, that wasn't just like, haha, we laugh at it. People actually lived. So people conformed with that law. Oh my gosh. Um, You needed (laughs) a doctor's certificate to buy margarine. (laughs) And that was to protect the dairy industry. Uh, Now, now people lived in accordance with that as well? Oh, you couldn't really get margarine for that reason. Okay. (laughs) I mean, there was no margarine market market because, because, you know. uh, the, the, if you wanted to, there was complete control of um, foreign currency. You couldn't get foreign currency. You had to apply to the government to get it. Mm. Uh, there's one of the guys who was a big figure in my, uh, the political party I got involved with later, was, uh, tells a nice story about his mother wanting to buy a book from overseas. And he went, she went to apply for her foreign currency from the government. And the, the, she was asked, well, why do you want this book? And why don't you just go to the library and get it? You say, 
ultimately you had to get permission from government bureaucrats to do the simplest things like buying a book. Uh, when you went on a holiday, if you wanted to go on a holiday overseas, you had to apply to the government to get the foreign currency to spend there. And the way it worked is you'd have to present your flights, your tickets, showing how, that proved how long you'd be away. And there was an allowance for how much money you could have for each day that you were away. But it wasn't enough, right, to stay at a nice hotel or anything overseas. So what people would do is they'd buy gold chains and they'd wear them as they left and then they'd sell them when they got overseas so they'd have enough money. Every, every import was licensed. You couldn't import anything. Cars, and the way you got rich in New Zealand was that you would get, you'd get close to the government, or to politicians, and you'd get an import license. And if you got an import license, you had exclusive rights to import something. One of the richest families in New Zealand is the Todd family. The Todd family had license to import cars. Cars in New Zealand, you wouldn't believe how much they cost. It was, uh, it was, so it was an extraordinary, extraordinary illiberal country. Mm -hmm. Homosexuality was illegal in New Zealand until 1985. If you knowingly rented your property to a homosexual, that was a crime. <laughs> Uh, you, so you get the picture, right? Yeah, wow. And the top rate of tax, my father was paying 66% income tax on his, the top bit of his income. So that was the situation. And the, it all radically changed from 1984, a new government came in. But, uh, you know, if you grow up in that environment and your father's living under that regime economically, you know, I watched him struggling, he was a businessman, he was always struggling with the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you react to that. And I think New Zealand has quite a large number of, let's call them libertarians, just because like classical liberal is quite a mouthful, um, on account of that history. Hmm. Now it's faded off. It says people of my generation and around, a little older, a little younger, that's where you find this clustering of libertarians. Younger people uh, who grew up in the more liberal regime they're now, they're not libertarians anymore. They're kind of actually, they're, they're probably social justice warriors mm. because they take all of this for granted. Right. They, don't know, they don't understand what it's like when they get what they want. If they were to get what they wanted, or they think they want, we'd effectively start going back to the old regime that we had because cause social justice warriors always want the government to control the economy because they want economic outcomes to be the result of judgments by wise people, not free transactions, because mm -hmm. free transactions don't end up giving them the pattern that they desire. Right. They have a vision of society, which markets don't guarantee that outcome, so they want to take over the, the economy so that they can, but that's the, well, they would end up back, you would eventually end up back where we were, with crony, cronyism, um, because you know somebody's got to get the contract to supply whatever it is, right? And so it's the friends of the politicians who get it. Um, and yeah, well, there will be, so that's why I'm a libertarian. I, I don't. I'm not a libertarian, by the way, in any uh, particular sense. Like I'm not a. I don't follow Ayn Rand. She's a nutcase, and I'm not a Nozickian or anything like that. I just mean by libertarian, I'm just wanting a, s a simple word for classical liberal. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so I've always been one. Okay. Is the answer. There wasn't some great moment when I became one. Uh, what has changed is. So it was always a gut feeling like the state should piss off, mm -hmm. like get out of our face and leave us alone. So there was an emotional element to it, mm -hmm. and that's always, been con that's always been there. Then when I started studying philosophy, I found, discovered Nozick and people like that. And for a while I believed in natural rights, but I quickly gave up on them. And then later I discovered the more economically based mm -hmm. free market people, you know, Hayek and so on. And that's really where I'm coming from nowadays. I'm really a utilitarian. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in natural rights. I do it in an attenuated sense, but let's not get boring. I don't, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't believe in them in the way that natural rights theorists do. Right. And I, the reason I'm in favor of free markets is that I think people flourish under them. Right. It's that's very interesting. Um, I suspect there is a similar uh, corollary in the states that there are a lot of people right now, the social justice warriors especially, the loudest, who haven't a clue about history um, and about the implementation of their vision 
onto the world and what actually happens in the real world. When you use that phrase, are you familiar with the work of Thomas Sowell? Yeah. So that's what makes me think the vision of the anointed about how everything is going to be equal and distributed across every person in, in that particular society. And it doesn't really matter the failures of that implementation to get that vision, even if it causes misery, it doesn't matter. It's everything gets sacrificed to try to achieve that in vision. And unfortunately, at least in the States, it sounds like maybe here, the millennial generation uh, is not particularly open to rational, reasonable discussion about the principles in economics, about the principles in history. There's just kind of, there's the march mentality, um, like we're seeing in the States right now, even a little bit of violence. Mm -hmm. People are, these social justice warriors are bumping up against some resistance they're not trying to persuade. They're saying, well, you're a bad person, and now you're maybe even a threat. So I agree with you entirely. And I think that the way I kind of put it is, if you, you know that saying, it's American one, is, like, is that all you got? Well, all they've got is an, a profound sense of their own righteousness. Right. They know nothing about political philosophy, about economics, about the, the history of political systems and what's happening. They, they know nothing and they don't care because they don't need to know that because they're righteous. And if you come up with all that crap, you're merely, they see all these things as mere uh, wicked tricks by wicked people to put up <laughs> obstacles in the way of justice. Love it. And they're self-indulgent. It, it's an utter self-indulgence because they're not at all serious about what would happen if they had their way. Right. They're just expressing themselves, but they're, and, they're expressing, and, and it's important to them too that they're better than you. Right? That, that, that's an important part of it too. They, they can't just be good, they've got to be better. Right. But I think it's a product of the way they've been raised, because they've been told that they're special from a very young age, and they're, more importantly, they've been told that their opinions matter, mm -hmm. even when they're totally ignorant. My, daughters are going through you know, schooling here and they're invited to have opinions on topics that they don't even begin to understand. Well, I think that's, that's giving them ideas above their station. Yeah. Thomas Sowell's a great example. Yeah. Thomas Sowell didn't, Thomas Sowell was just studying until he was about 45. He hardly published anything, right? And now the guy's got such a body of knowledge. I mean, he's an amazing, he's, a, he's an amazing man. But there's a kind of humil seriousness about him, a kind of humility. Right. There's absolutely no humility in the social justice warriors. And as you say, it's pure signaling. Well, I think that's an interesting way of putting it, that they're invited to have opinions about topics they don't understand. Because what you get is the only way that they generate their opinion is by their immediate feeling about mm -hmm. something. So it goes straight from, well, this is how I feel. That's bad. Therefore, that is my rationally held and stated position and that's really what you get when you scratch the surface of right. a lot of these people and it's just feeling and there's no system in their thought so that you know the, the Frederick Bastiat's point about the, the seen and the unseen mm -hmm. well they're utterly obsessed with the scene right so there's something that has grabbed their attention let's say and sometimes it's just an image so let's say it's, it's a sweatshop in Indonesia and they go boohoo that's bad we don't like the sweatshop those people look at them they, they look uncomfortable and unhappy in that sweatshop so, so obviously, and again, everything to them, it's always obvious that the solution is the power of the state. So it should be shut down. Or the government should ban the purchase of products made in those places. And then now they've done, they've done something righteous. They've, they've saved those people. Well, have they? Where do those people go once the sweatshop's shut down? By hypothesis, the sweatshop was the best job opportunity those people had. Otherwise, they wouldn't have taken it. Now you've, you've eliminated their best job opportunity because it offended you. Right. Have you really done them a favor? You've hurt them. You must have hurt them because you took away what they considered to be their best option. If you sent them enough money that they didn't need to work anymore in the sweatshop, you've done them a favor. <laughs> but of course that actually costs you. Right. One of the other things about, they want righteousness at no cost. So they can go and cry in a, in, a, in a march and fall on the ground and weep and they're having a whale of a time. But it's, it costs them nothing right. and it does no one any good. They're kind of, the, you know the old idea of Christian charity which was that you didn't, you didn't even 
mention it, you just did it. Mm -hmm. right? And nobody knew that you had done it. They're the absolute opposite of that. They do no good at all, but they draw endless attention right. to their own virtue. Right. It then, uh, I mean, can't tell you how sickening I find them. Yes, um, I'm glad that you can freely say that because I th there is a very much a strong counter, it's, it's almost the countercultural. The new countercultural movement is like a counter countercultural movement in the sense that those people think, the social justice warriors think that they're railing against the man and the injustice in the world, and yet the real radicals now are to reject that kind of popular social signaling and say, look, let's take a rational approach to look at the, the problems, in quotes, of the sweatshops in India. Like, yeah, the image upsets you, but like you say, there's the seen and then there's the unseen. And the sad reality is, <clears throat> in a circumstance like that, I know UNICEF did a study where, I don't know if it was a sweatshop, um, it was, oh, it was uh, child labor laws. They said, you know, uh, in India, too many young people are working in factories, so we're going to ban um, people from under, I don't know what it was, nine or something, 13, that was something mm -hmm. crazy, uh, from working in those factories. And then they did a study that said, yeah, sure enough, child labor went down in the factories. Wow, but there was a spike in child prostitution. Yeah. I was but actually there's no picture of those. about to guess that. Yeah. Um, and and uh, there'll, be a sp uh, there'll be hungry families. Exactly. Uh, as I say, that there's no system in the thought, and there's a dominant, it's a, it's, what's happening, it seems to me, culturally with young people is the triumph of sentiment over reason. Mm -hmm. They're terribly sentimental. Um, and they, and there's partly that's because there's the, the triumph over reason is partly because there has, over the last 40 years, been systematic undermining of the value of reason within the academy. So you, you can, when I was studying for my PhD at Cambridge, I was, I was associated with the philosophy faculty, obviously, but also there was a department of the history and philosophy of science, which I had a lot to do with because I did philosophy of science work. And within that, there were the kind of philosophers and then there were the sociologists. Mm -hmm. The historians of science were often kind of sociologists and there was something known as the sociology of science, which was a hot topic at the time. And most of the sociologists of science were um, so-called relativists about truth. Mm -hmm. So they didn't believe that there were, was any scientific reality that scientists discovered. They believed instead that scientists um, kind of created a dominant narrative that got accepted. Mm -hmm. And you know the the reason the Earth orbits the, the Earth does the Earth orbit the Sun? Well, according to these guys, well that's what people say, you know, and and that that narrative has done, has won out, and so the scientists will go along with. It. But they made that fact; they didn't discover it. It was by making that idea the dominant narrative, the scientists created the fact that, that, that this was the kind of view going around. Right. And so they don't believe in any objective reality, and right. they they saw um, they saw science as a purely sociological process in which some groups got dominant over others. And if you think about reason and reality in that way, of course, there's no particular why bother studying economics, because you're just kind of it's all just a battle of wills. And if I say to these social justice warriors, well, you're wrong about what's causing the problems you think are problems and about what the solutions are. You don't understand the various effects. And you, know, you bring up economic theory, let's say. They will see what you're doing as a mere attempt to bully them. Right. Because there isn't any truth of the matter. I mean, they don't believe in all of that stuff. Right. They are the righteous ones. You're the bad one. You can tell you are, partly because you're a white man. Um, and they, they need to win because they're on the good side. And so the best thing is to, for example, no platform you. Don't allow you to say those right, things. Right. So it's a pure battle. It's not a battle of ideas. It's not a battle of who's right about the, re the reality because they've rejected all that stuff. It's a simple battle. It's a it's simple power struggle. Uh, and they believe that they can kind of, that they, I mean, they're nuts. It's totally nuts, right? But that is how they see it, I think. I think. Okay, so forget everything I wanted to talk to you about. Let's talk about that. And you've just stated a position that I've suspected um, and a lot of people are talking about that I think is true that in a very real way this movement that we're talking about the social justice movement is an outgrowth an extension or an expression a philosophy yeah and perhaps a 
demonstration, not only of why philosophy is important, but if you, where, if you get the fundamentals wrong, if your position is, no, nah, there's no such thing as objective reality, that might have some very real consequences, if right. not immediately. Maybe it starts in no. the Oxford discussions, it, exactly. but when it gets into the general it public. It trickles through, trickles exactly. down. I don't believe in trickle-down economics, but I do believe in trickle-down ideology. Right. Um, I think so, too. I saw this, yeah, as I said, I mean, at the time, I just thought the people I was dealing with, because I'll give you an anecdote. I got a, after I finished my PhD, I got a fellowship at Cambridge, and I had to give a talk to my college the, that I was a fellow of that was accessible to non, because I was one of two philosophers, they're all, you know, the colleges are all mixed up. It's quite nice. You've got historians and scientists of various kinds. And, so I gave this talk. And it was called Relativism is Absolutely False. Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, I, they enjoyed it, the general audience, because a lot of them were frustrated by dealing with relativists in their own subject area. And they have common sense. Uh, and one guy who was particularly keen on it was, it was a, he was one of those guys, he was an anthropologist, kind of historical anthropologist. He'd done great work on migrations, you know, humans around the world. And, um, but he was always encountering relativism in his subject. And it, in his subject, it took the form of native people saying, no, no, your theories are all wrong. Um, you know, they're based on genetic evidence and all that kind of thing, but that's just cultural, that's just intellectual imperialism. Mm -hmm. We have our own myths. I know the Aborigines come from the belt. They don't come from where you say they come from. They come from the belly of a lizard because that's our story. And how dare you uh, approach it your way because that's just, that's just Anglo-Saxon or European uh, intellectual imperialism when you tell me that the Aborigines migrated from here to there and so on. Now, who is it that's saying the, the, this? this? He is... would encounter this when he was doing his work. Amongst his colleagues? So, so, yeah, some of his colleagues, for example, uh, he spoke about a particular Aboriginal professor of anthropology who would say this. This was actually a professor of anthropology who would say, we come from a lizard's belly. Now, again, you see, I don't think he really believed they came from a lizard's belly. It was a, a struggle. I'm going to force you to sit there and listen to me talking all this crap because you're scared politically mm -hmm. to argue with me. And there was a culture of, of fear. He, he told me that in a conference where this guy was talking all this crap, he was the only one who was willing to stand up and argue with them because all the others were too scared. And this, by the way, is the early 90s. So I gave the same talk about relativism is absolutely false at the History and Philosophy of Science uh, department and it's, you know, it's all normal argument, philosophical type argument, very, but more clear than usual because I'd written it for a non-specialist audience. And it was full of, full of arguments and you know, it was pretty clear. And at the end of it, some people engaged with the argument, but one guy, one of the leading sociologist types, relativist, stood up and he didn't deal with my argument at all. He said that I should be ashamed of myself mm -hmm. for having given such a talk. Um, to this audience. He said it was, he used a different an example that is too historically contextualized for me to use now. But basically he said, you're like an imam who says that homosexuals will burn in hell, giving a talk to a gay conference. And it's outrageous. I, I remember, and then everybody, when we were off, people came up and said, you know, I've got tut tutted for weeks. People were shaking their head with really? dismay that I'd done this. Yeah, because it's not, they're not interested in the truth, right? They're not interested, they're not, it's not, that wasn't what was going on. They're staking out their turf and you've got no right to challenge their ideas. This isn't a university, this is at Cambridge University, right? Uh, so I should have seen all this coming. I, I thought it was some crackpot bunch within a little branch of academia. But of course, you know, students have gone through and been taught all this. If you if you do a course in almost any subject now, in the humanities, you'll get kind of methodological chat around the fringes of it, most of which is kind of relativistic. For example, you know, history, well, you'll get all sorts of stuff now about whose history, as if there is no, there are no facts of history, right? There's just different people telling different versions of events, and they tell those versions in accordance with their background or their cultural context. and. And there's no, you shouldn't argue, you can't say, no, you're wrong, you've got the facts wrong, actually this happened. That's just imperialism. Right. And so everybody's gone through this, so it's no wonder to me
that the social justice warriors are as we've described. Okay, so there's two, two points here. <clears throat> One, it sounds like, so this is a blunt way of putting it. There's a lot of belief by regular folk who haven't had the elite education that when you go to a university that's that elite like Cambridge or Oxford or Harvard, you get, in essence, an anti-education insofar as you might go in thinking, believing in such naive things as objective truth and objective facts, and then you, in some of that high-level relativism, uh, you'll learn that those beliefs are kind of weak, and then you'll discover the truth, which is that there is no truth. And if that's a contradiction, well, that's part of the, mist that's the, part of the pull of it. <laughs> so, so that's the first part. Do you think that it's fair to say that th the regular uneducated, in quotes, suspicion of higher ed. And this is, this is back in the 80s you're talking about. So, right? Uh, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Late 80s, early 90s. And it's, it seems like it's only gotten worse since. I know since I have an undergraduate education. Do you think that there's some, there's some truth to say there is a bit of foundational um, chopping at people's intellectual foundations when they're talking about something as essential as whether or not there's even truth in the first place? Well, I'll start by saying that most of the sciences are unaffected by this. Not all, actually. Some of the um, more science, bio sciences that interact with human matters, um, social sciences, let's say, are heavily affected by it. Maybe you don't think of them as sciences. But a lot of the sciences are, are free of all this nonsense, right? physics and so on. Then within the humanities um, and the social sciences, there is still some great stuff being done. Um, and, sure. And, you know, so I'm not, I don't want to say general, but I think that in general, most people who go and study humanities at most universities probably do themselves mental damage. They'd be better off. They'd have a better. They'd have a clearer understanding of the world. Be less prone to believe bullshit if they had never gone. For example, who would believe? Who hadn't? Who hadn't gone to university? Would believe that the sun is a social construct. <laughs> now, you, you've got to have some pretty good universification right. to be willing to believe that shit. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 the, the left actually, act, there's been a hijacking of, the, of higher education and perhaps even secondary education and primary education by a worldview by people who have that worldview, and it takes incredible resilience to go through the process and come out the other end without being imbued with that worldview. Right. In fact, I, you know, I, I suspect I was. It took me up to a point. Right. I never, I never went for the relativism, but it took me quite a long time after leaving university to get over certain kinds of uh, ideas about... <sighs> I, I think the mistake I made, I thought that everything had to be organized. Mm -hmm. On this worldview, all order, all cooperation has to be planned by an authority. Mm -hmm. I had no idea when I left how much of the world was spontaneous order. And I think that, that that's the socialist worldview that most people have. They don't even realize it's a socialist worldview or it's the statist worldview. Is that they can't even imagine voluntary and spontaneous solutions to the problems that they think the state is the solution to. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because they don't know enough. They know nothing of the pre-state world. I mean, in New Zealand, New Zealand's particularly bad in this regard because New Zealand started roughly in the late 19th century. It's a very young country. And the state had already started to take off in Europe, um, first in Germany, and Britain followed a little later to have big state apparatus. But by the time New Zealand was really developed, uh, it, it, the state was already doing a lot of things that it hadn't done in the past. Uh, like for example, providing railways and providing schools and all that kind of thing. And most New Zealanders have got, can't even imagine um, private provision of these things. Right. And, and I think that that's one of the, and of course, it's hidden from them. The education system never tells them 
But they, of course, because they all work for the state, <laughs> they've got an interest in not passing on this bit of information. And they also genuinely don't know. Right. I mean, I had to, I had to learn a lot of that um, after I left the academy. And, and I, think most, I think most New Zealanders, most Brits, most Americans can't imagine. For example, take health and safety. I remember once somebody telling me, you know, food safety was somebody telling me that they would come over to my view of things, my liberal, I'm truly liberal, libertarian view of things, if I could do one thing, and I'd never be able to do it, she suggested, which is to say how there could possibly be food safety without the state. <laughs> <laughs> and which is really amazing because when you think of it, one thing that consumers really will demand is safe food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that nobody would demand it and it wouldn't be supplied if the state didn't force it on everybody is utterly ludicrous. It is. I mean, I, I mean you know these grading systems, in New Zealand you see them in A usually, and, and behind the counter of a food server, which is a certification that the kitchen's clean and all that kind of thing. That would be supplied privately, but people, they can't imagine, they can't even imagine it, right? They say, I'm against health and safety rules. Um, again, they think there would therefore be no health, there would be no safety. Workplaces would be completely dangerous because, and again, I think part of it is they don't understand price mechanisms. I think that's correct, and I think they don't understand the power that the consumer has because they view they view an, an exchange where I'm buying a sandwich as a, like a power exchange. Yes. That, he, that person's got the goods, and I'm like subjected to them and hoping they don't poison yeah. me with their sandwich. Yeah, it, it's a, I was just go, I think this gets to the the heart of. Forget the metaphysical or the epistemological wonkiness that we were discussing earlier. If you think about a, a, a worldview that is the foundation of the anti-market sentiment that is prevalent now, is seeing power everywhere yeah. in markets. So they see all market interactions as being a strong party pushing around a weak party. Uh, and oddly, sometimes it's the consumer that has the power and sometimes it's the supplier that has the power. So for example, um, the, if I go shopping for food at a supermarket, they see me as the victim and the supermarket is the menace. If that, that's, in that case, the consumer is the victim. In labor relations, they see it the other way around. So if I'm supplying my labor and you are buying my labor, then I'm the victim. Right. Um, it's it's really very very strange. I mean, if you talk to actual employers, they'll point out how desperately hard they find it yeah. to get and keep good staff. They feel very vulnerable. Right. Um, similarly, if you're a consumer of, I mean, look at look at normal consumers. The the deal they get just keeps getting better and better and better. Why? Because the suppliers have not got any power. They can't make you buy their stuff. You've got to choose to buy their stuff. And, and various suppliers are competing for that. So of course you get a better deal. The social justice warriors, they would replace all of that with their own edicts. You will have this because this is what you deserve. Right. But it'll be crap. And it might, you may deserve it, but you probably don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder, kind of in conclusion here, <clears throat> going back to the phenomena that's hap that happened at Cambridge and Oxford, and I think that is well, still Well, it wasn't happening. particularly there. I mean, right. it was just right. across the board. I think okay. so. Is, so, first of all, it is fascinating and tragic that there would be such a popular anti-intellectual belief coming at the highest levels of academia. Mm -hmm. Anti-intellectual in the sense that fundamentally opposed to even the idea of the pursuit of truth because they reject the idea of there being a truth. I would consider mm -hmm. that explicitly anti-intellectual. So... It's sad, it's tragic, it's got these consequences in society, but there's a really interesting question that I haven't solved yet, which is, why is it so popular? Because it's easy. Well, but in the, higher, in the higher levels of academia, is it because it's, a, what I suspect is it has some intimate connection with politics. There's some, there's some hook that people on the left get. When you undercut this idea of objective truth, it's like it, it is a... It is a way for the left, in particular, I think because arguments aren't on, on their side for political philosophic reasons, where if they can make it not about the facts and they make it about intentions and feelings and, and about power, 
that gives them a little bit of an edge. Well, I can help to connect this okay. to the left for you. Okay. Why, why it's the left in particular who like yeah. this idea now. Okay. And it's because it, once you say, okay, there's no truth and there's no rationality, there's just a conflict of um, ideologies or worldviews coming out of different groups. Then you, you add on, well, who, which group should win, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the historical victims should win. Women, racial minorities, the poor. It would be dreadful if the already rich and powerful would win in this struggle. Now, it just so happens that people on the left are the representatives of the poor and the racial minorities and the, women's, the women. And so they win by default if you get rid of truth and reason. Right? They, they triumph because they are the representatives of the group who must be favored in the competition. So you know all this stuff about intersectionality. Right? Mm -hmm. And the whole the point is that it's the most disadvantaged, like the, the lesbian, disabled black woman, mm -hmm. right, whose view must carry the most weight. Right. Um, that suits, that idea suits the political left because they want to pursue the policies that they think will benefit those people. So there is a direct, it's a simple connection. I, I think, oh, let me do some big, big history here. And I think it's, 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 you had authoritarianism as a kind of intellectual model pr prior to the um, Enlightenment. And the authorities were kings, priests, you know, the church, the, the, what they said went. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Enlightenment, and they go, no, no, there's actually reality, and we can discover what it is through scientific methods and kind of inquiry. And, and you know, people like you and me, I suspect, love that, and we think this is, this is what, it was that change of attitude that explains all the progress we've made over the last few hundred years. Mm -hmm. And then, but then people are rejecting it, actually. They're rejecting those Enlightenment ideals. Yes. They're going back to the pre-Enlightenment thing where it's authority, but they're inverting it. It's no longer the strong and dominant who get to have their say, who get to tell you how it is. It's the weak and vulnerable. So it's, it's a return to the pre-enlightenment authoritarian model about how you arrive at opinions, but inverted socially. Mm -hmm. uh, you see this all the time. So this is a, that's a long version of it. I, you think about uh, what happened on the political left. Originally, the left in politics in Britain uh, was People, in my opinions, the Liberal Party in Britain were the left wing, and they were opposing the Conservatives, the right wing. And the Liberals, the left wing, were in favour of free markets and free trade, especially free trade. That was what well, they were very keen on, and so on. Then, the labour the labour movement emerges a bit later, and they reject liberalism. They go back to authoritarianism of the, just like the Conservatives had had, except. It's in the interests of the workers, right, in theory. Mm -hmm. It's a similar pattern. You see the thing, you've, got, you've gone from an authoritarian model to a liberal model, then back to an authoritarian model, but with a different group of people doing the authorizing. So what do you think about this? I like that, except there's one variable here that makes me think maybe that power structure is not quite as inverted, because there are many cases now of people who are in, who were traditionally in those groups like homosexuals in the United States, who express conservative opinions, or black individuals in the United States, they express their interest in free markets, and they're immediately seen as part of the oppressing group. So it's not their status in terms of their, their social position or their qualities if they're disabled. It's more like if they're towing that party line. Mm -hmm. So that makes me think it's all, it still s smells like it's a it's a powerful group of people that are just using that to maintain their. It abs yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should. I agree with you. Yeah. So um, Thomas Sowell's and Uncle Tom. Right. right. Exactly. Um, yeah, they don't care about the disadvantaged groups. Right. They're using them. They're pets. They're they're they're, they're uh, I need to be given privileges because I'm representing the victims. Right. It's the representatives of the victims. The the kind of you're. Do you really think black leaders in America have like, the, these kind of hucksters like um, 
Al Sharpton and so on, Jesse, do you think they've benefited black people? They've benefited themselves enormously yeah. on behalf of the, apparently on behalf of black people. But yeah, the, the black people are there for them. They see the black people as, we have this in New Zealand. There's a, something called the Maori Party, who represent, obviously, Maori interests. And they are very keen on, they're very paternalistic towards Maori. Uh, I was in a debate with a woman who's a lead, one of the leaders of the Maori Party about whether there should be sugar taxes. And she's very keen on sugar taxes because some Maori are overweight. And she was very keen on um, very punitive tobacco taxes because Maori smoke disproportionately. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'd been advocating the right of people to make these trade-offs for themselves, you know. Do I? And she was very hostile to this kind of view. And at one point I blurted out, I think she hates me now, that um, I seem to have more respect for her people, as she describes them, than she does. And her vision was of her as being some kind of nobility, noble member, and the, uh, all the her people, as she kept saying, yeah. were the little people who she would look after. Right. And she was their shepherd, so to speak. Right. And of course, I find that disgusting. I don't want people to be sheep. I don't want to be their shepherd. I want them all to be independent human beings. But she, she, you can see that she wouldn't have a political career, she wouldn't have a status if those people were independent human beings. She needs them to be down because she's, how else could she be their protector? Now, do you think this is conscious, though? Or do you think that this is no. genuinely the individuals no. who view themselves as just virtuous enough yeah, to no, be I, a I don't think it's conscious, of course. Okay. You couldn't. Even at the top levels? <sighs> yeah, I don't think it's conscious. Okay. I, I don't think they bring it to consciousness. Why would you bring that to consciousness? <laughs> okay. That's not going to help you do a good job, even. Okay. Right? You, wanna, you, you need to really hype yourself up to believe that you believe that you're doing all this for their good. You'll be a much better con man if, if you can do that. I, I had a guy I worked for once who was a terrible liar. And it, the funny thing, I'd watch him lie, lie, and the way he built up to lying to our clients is that he first started practicing on me. So we would be in the office, and he, he'd say something, he'd say... And I said, but that didn't happen. You know, we'd... And he'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'd laugh the first time. He'd laugh the first time he'd laugh. Then he'd say it again, and he keeps saying it. And after a while, I fell silent. And then, I could, then I'd hear him telling a client on the phone. Right? And he'd been, Prepping. he'd been warming up. And honestly, by the time he'd finished with this, he seemed to believe it. Hmm. So I don't think, if you're going to be alive, if you're going to do these things, you need to convince yourself. You know, I think Hillary Clinton probably really believes that she has, was going to help women and poor people in America and all that, but that somehow she has a sanctity to her. I think that's a very charitable, well, I'm not sure if that's ch charitable. It is either the case that she's self-deluded in that yeah, respect? Yeah, she's self-deluded. That's all yeah. I mean. Okay. Yeah. See, I, I, my suspicion, specifically with that case, maybe not with the others, that one, I think, is just a case of pure sociopathy. Yeah, she may be, actually. Yeah, but, but others, I think, I think you're right. I think, on the whole, you kind of have to be... You, you have to have fooled yourself to, to do it, and to do it effectively. You had a question that you, that you didn't ask, which is... But I, I want to answer it. Okay. Um, which is, you asked me if I, feel, if, I get, if I feel bad because I give these cold economic arguments. It's not if you feel bad, it's if you find it difficult to engage with people that keep insisting you must be heartless. Right. But I think, with the, okay, this relates to the, the seen and the unseen thing. Mm -hmm. Because you, you get these characters who point to some problem which they're going to alleviate through force of the state. And that looks like they care. And, and you don't. But what about so you want to, I want to point out, well, there are all these other effects, and they har they're harmful to many people. And it seems to me that, though not as sentimental, because the, the, you, you're taking kind of a systemic approach, and you, know, you don't pick out a sobbing child, mm -hmm. it's not as sentimental, it is actually more compassionate, mm -hmm. because you're taking account of everything, not the ones that you happen to have noticed and, and got all your feelings worked up about. So and it, it doesn't give you the same, it doesn't look as nice, it's not as flashy, but is actually more virtuous, I believe. 
And I wish I could get people to see this, but I think this is I, a I universal can't. problem with libertarians. Is per I was talking to a uh, professor at Harvard specifically about this, that it is, especially when you're talking about trade-offs. So when you're talking about welfare, for example, you could make a very strong case that like welfare in the United States actively hurts the well-being of those it's designed to help. However, in changing that system to benefit more people, individuals are going to lose out on benefits and may, may have difficulties in their lives. And to make that case for the greater good, kind of in a utilitarian approach, is, has this image because you can zoom in on the people that are being hurt by the change in policy. It's got this image problem, and I don't know exactly how to solve it other than just the rationalist approach that doesn't seem to persuade well, that. I'll give people. you a very contemporary example of people for only, only looking at one side of a, a problem or an event. Uh, I believe that Trump has just done an executive order to reintroduce the, is it called the global gag? The, you know, the thing where any charity getting US government aid money overseas can't mention or encourage or even mention abortion. Mm. Now, there were headlines here saying that this was um, robbing women of their right to an abortion. Well, first off, it isn't, right? Because it doesn't get changed the law in those countries. It just doesn't sponsor abortion. So it hasn't removed their right. Um, actually, I was pointing out, Samoa doesn't fund any such charities. Has Samoa ever been accused of removing women's right to an abortion? Anyway, never mind that. But think of the other side of the equation. This is tax money, right? So tax money is removed from people on threat of imprisonment. Many, many Americans are anti-abortion, right? a lot. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to confiscate people's money on threat of imprisonment and then use it for a purpose to which they are deeply morally opposed? Is that okay? I think that looks bad, right? As a principle. Yeah, that, that right. looks bad to me. Right. And yet the people getting hysterical about this terrible action by Trump, they don't ever bother to tell you why it's okay to force people to donate money to charities that they are opposed to. Why, why don't, and oddly enough, I know this very well, I know that if I brought this up in, in the media in New Zealand, they would think I was an ideological maniac right. and I'm a mean guy. They would, they would think, that, I, I assure you, and yet I, it's just, I just, I'm just out of tune with the current sentiments. They don't, people have got no qualms about using force to have their will done. So if I, if I think abortion's a good thing, I don't then hesitate to force people who disagree with me to fund it. But this is, and they, don't, they don't see any problem with that. I think that's an awesome note to end on. Um, so thanks so much for this conversation. It's been great. Thank you. Let's go and have a drink. All right, that was my conversation with Dr. Jamie White. I'm sure you guys enjoyed it. I certainly did. Dr. White and I also had a fantastic conversation afterwards, I probably should have recorded it, about politics, about the political situation in New Zealand, the political, political situation in the United States. And I'm sure you guys would have appreciated that interesting, classically liberal analysis. If you like these conversations, you appreciate the show and the project and the mission of what I'm trying to do, then check out patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can become a patron of the show. And a special shout out to all of the patrons. Right now, I think we're about 75 or so. So thanks, guys. You are helping make this show possible. All right, that's all I have for you today. Enjoy your week.